before we get started, here's a quick table of contents so you know what I'll be covering in this video. Enjoy! Alright, let's get some of the big ones out of the way first. My question is, how the hell did you keep going? I've always wanted to share my characters with the world, but every time I start, I just can't seem to keep with it. This is a huge question, and one I'm sure a lot of people relate to. Let me begin to answer it by telling you about a time when I didn't keep going, because it's happened to me, too. I did try a Skyrim Let's Play a couple years, I think, before I started the Dawnbreaker saga, but it didn't end up going anywhere past the first episode for a couple of reasons. First, I was comparing myself to Couch Warrior at the height of the Fleet Featherstone days, and trying to hold myself to a standard that I just couldn't reach at that point. I wanted to have that level of spectacle without realizing that it requires a huge amount of work that I just didn't know how to do. Second, I didn't have anything holding back the scope of that project that never was, so the whole game was open for me to roam around in without purpose and quickly became overwhelming. The two things I did differently with the Dawnbreaker saga were one, I didn't try to compare myself with Couch or Rykon or the Panicked Monk, especially early on. I made a deal with myself to start where I was and use what I had, and see if I got better along the way rather than trying to be my best right off the bat, which held back the spectacle creep until about the last year or so. Two, I split up the game between multiple characters for a couple of different reasons, the most important of which being to limit scope creep. Having each character be devoted to a single questline, at least when I started my planning very early on, gave me some semblance of focus and a goal to reach. Like, I knew if I hit that point in the story and was bored crapless of it, I could just call that the finale and do something else. It took off a lot of the pressure of, oh, this other series is super long, how am I ever going to make it that far? The answer is one episode at a time. The other reason I split up Dawnbreakers into each of the different characters actually has to do with managing motivation while having ADHD, which is something a lot of us struggle with, particularly in the gaming community, and is probably the real meat of this question. Because the squirrel brain wants to do all of the things, and never wants to just sit on one thing for long periods of time, which is why I split up the game into chunks rather than one big thing. Particularly when I was starting out, I could take a week and focus on just one character, produce a huge chunk of content for them, and release it on a pretty regular schedule. While those episodes were going up, I could focus on a different, shiny new character, and then so on and so forth. Rotating the focus on each character gave me a chance to let the inevitable boredom subside before I came back to each one. That's the secret superpower of having ADHD. We get super excited about things, and then super bored of things in quick succession, but we can almost always count on ourselves to get re-excited about things again. The trick is... Working with that oscillation of focus rather than trying to fight it. For many people, I assume it would be easy to look at this channel and say I do one thing. Skyrim. But the sheer number of hats that I wear and characters I get to tinker with is what has kept my brain engaged this whole time. So, not only was making a big cast of characters a narrative thing, but also a strategic thing. I'm not sure if it'll work for anyone else, but that's what worked for me. And if you're wondering how I did it when all of them came together, part of that was knowing each episode would still focus on a different character, and part of that was letting my brain squirrel off to do research into things like screenwriting techniques, visual storytelling, character design, and sometimes falling down what's new in paleontology rabbit holes. So to recap, because that was a long one, don't compare yourself to other people, Try to give yourself and your characters a goal to reach that's actually doable, and try rotating characters rather than focusing on just one for long periods of time. Whew. Jeez. I hope any of that made sense. What's going to happen to Mordgood? I think her story should not end just yet. For the moment, she's going to be helping the companions, checking in on Kinoa every once in a while, and doing odd jobs around Skyrim. I plan to bring her and most of the rest of the Dawnbreakers out of vacation if and when more Beyond Skyrim comes out. Obviously, Yarnvita's retired, so Mordgood is going to have to take over the heavy hitter duty, but I think she'll be able to manage it. Especially with some off-screen training from Farkas and Vilkas. 
But I absolutely agree with you. Mordgood is a lot of fun and I hope either more Beyond Skyrim is soon on the horizon or that Elder Scrolls VI will have a small enough time gap that I could justify bringing her into wherever it ends up being. This is sort of a question that could be asked of all of the Dawnbreakers, honestly. And the answer for all of them is... They'll keep living, having relationships, trying not to drive themselves and each other crazy. They just won't be doing it on camera for a while. Don't worry, I'm backing up everyone's faces and making copious notes about their equipment, skills, and levels in case I need to rebuild them in the future. I'm also leaving the Dawnbreaker's mod profile intact on Vortex, even though I'll be making a new one for the next project. I'm hopeful that we'll get to see more of Mordgood and the others in the future. Similarly, I wonder if Theral will be in any future plans. So this is something I never found a good way to explain in-world, but the reason that Mordgood's journal got all borked and the reason that we haven't seen Theral at all in the Dawnbreaker saga, in spite of having heard from her, is complicated, and cross-universal with Couch Warrior's Lorecon saga. For those that aren't familiar, I imagine most of you came here from Couch's channel, but I'm gonna do a recap anyway. Ascendance introduced the idea that when the Dragonborn, in our case Kinoa, in his case Idastag, slew Alduin, it fixed the hole in time up at the throat of the world and caused a dragon break. In the Ascendance version of the universe, this reset time to before the Dragonborn Covenant assembled in Skyrim, but left all of them with their memories of what had happened. In the Dawnbreakers version of the universe, time continued as normal, but because of the reset in the other universe, not only did the dragon break, but so did the journal. Because Theral's home universe went back several years, it more or less rendered their communication non-existent, even though it still definitely happened as far as Mordgood's timeline goes. So the messages resolved into, like, cosmic wingdings instead of anything intelligible. It's like the universe 404'd and the save got corrupted, but only in the pages of her journal. Like if someone took out a mod mid-game and ended up with a missing texture, not to get too meta with it. Mordgood still does have all of those memories, though. So, if, hypothetically, Beyond Skyrim comes out with Expedition to Atmora sooner rather than later, she does still remember that Ida Stag was an Atmoran, and might want to go north to see if she can figure out what happened to him. Just saying. And speaking of things that I didn't find a good way to explain in-game, what exactly is Kinoa's relationship with the past? Who were all of those people? <laughs> Buckle up, y'all. So, for those that haven't gone as far down that particular chunk of the Elder Scrolls iceberg as I have, I fully admit to being an incurable nerd in that regard, Kinoa is a Shezarin. That means she's basically an avatar or reincarnation or whatever have you of Shezar, aka Shore, aka Lorcon, aka the pseudo-divine that went to Magnus and said, Hey, let's do a group project and build a world. Same naming convention as the Nerevarine being the reincarnation of Indoril Nerevar. Confirmed Shezarines across the lore are sort of debated. And like all lore in the Elder Scrolls, it's a bit like trying to nail down water. So I narrowed it down to the three dudes that were also given the title of Ismir, whom I have affectionately nicknamed the Grumpy Old Men Squad. Palinal Whitestrake, who I actually didn't know was also called Ismir at some point until I looked it up for this, is the probably Nedic guy for whom the term Shezarine was coined. He was also the one who ran around in the first era making an absolute bloody mess of the aliens who were in power at the time, and some of them probably deserved it, as well as no small number of Khajiit whom he mistook for elves. He was basically driven by rage and rage alone and is generally considered not a good person because he didn't really have an off switch when he went into berserk mode. He's also known as the Divine Crusader, and had a rather intense beef with Akatosh, which I personally assume is because the Dragon God of Time did kinda rip Shore's heart out. Pelinal is infamous for having no heart, so makes sense to me. One of the songs of Pelinal, I forget which, mentions that a soldier who correctly called him out on being a Shazarine got smothered to death in his sleep by moths, which is why Arden is so leery about talking about it, or at very least naming it. There's also a theory that tends to float around about Pelinal being a magical cyborg from the future, 
And while I could go into a whole video just outlining why I think that's not the most likely reality, I'll just sum it up by saying a lot of the way backstories in the Elder Scrolls lore use metaphor and flowery language and probably shouldn't be read literally. It's much more likely, in my opinion, that Pelinol was a briar heart. But I'm just gonna leave that comment here and move on. Also, shout out to the scribe, who was actually correct about Pelinol's lover that got killed being a guy. Good on you, and my bad. <laughs> King Wolfarth of Atmora, also known as the Ash King, is another bearer of the title Ismir. He was famous mostly for being a warmonger, showing up at the Battle of Red Mountain, and subsequently getting dispatched by either Vivek or Nerevar. He then turned into a ghost of sorts for a long period of time, and kept popping up throughout history until about Tiber Septim's time, and also during the events of Daggerfall, apparently, as the Underking, who eventually gets merged with Zirin Arctis, and... I haven't played Daggerfall, so I'm not sure I understand the whole context there. In Dawnbreakers, I rationalized him showing back up as all of the Shezarines having some degree of being able to recall past lives, which also handily explains why Pelinal was so pissy if he was only one step removed from Lorcan. And then there's Tiber Septum, aka Talos Stormcrown, arguably the most widely known of the Ismirs. Conquered Tamriel, or united it, depending on who you ask, back at the end of the Second Era, ascended to godhood as far as anyone's able to tell, and was unquestionably Dragonborn, just like the last Dragonborn. He may or may not have had his soul merged with Zern Arctis and or Wolfharth at some point, I don't know, the lore is deliberately ambiguous as far as that whole thing goes. And at some point in his reign, he got his throat cut, which prevented him from using his voice, which I brought up a couple of times in the series. So. Kinoa remembers all three of them as past lives, pretty much. She was them, but they are no longer her. It's one of those things with Kinoa that I probably should have focused her character on rather than trying to do all kinds of other things as well, but... That's just how it ended up, and all I can really do is take what I learned and move on at this point. I could do a whole video on things I could have done better with just her, honestly. As for this question, I think I've answered it to the best of my ability without going too far down the rabbit hole, and should probably move on before the weeds take over. Speaking of Kinoa... So, is Lavender's alteration magic setting up Kinoa's transition? The possibility is certainly there, but right at the moment I'm unfortunately limited in my ability to actually voice anyone whose range goes deeper than, well, this. <laughs> Unless they're somewhere in my Ingrath register, which is also why Mordgood's friendly ghost Crow didn't have a bigger part in the story. Maybe I just need to voice an Argonian for a few years and see what happens to my vocal cords. The good news is that my mic likes to bass boost things that get really close to it. The bad news is, if I'm not practically throat singing, there isn't a whole lot of bass in my voice for it to boost. As an aside about Kinoa's pronouns and identity, I will keep referring to her as she for simplicity's sake, since she's sort of... Schrodinger's gender right at the moment? Are they non-binary? Is he trans? As of the canon as it stands, only Shore knows. EJ, have you ever thought of doing a roleplay for one of the Fallout games? I've thought of it, yes, but there are a few things keeping me from doing it. One, zombies. Fun fact, I have a fear of decomposing corpses. Two, I know next to nothing about the world or the lore, and while I could learn, I much prefer the lore of the Elder Scrolls universe. And three, nuclear apocalypse and dystopias have already been done to death, and I'm a strictly hope-punk storyteller these days. Which brings me to a point about doing roleplays of other games which people have asked about, like the other Elder Scrolls games and for some reason Vampire the Masquerade. I use Skyrim almost exclusively because it works better than any other game I've found as a single-player campaign world. I'm basically sitting here playing Dungeons & Dragons with myself, and am collaborating with the game to be the characters and the DM. The only other game I've considered doing this with is Ark Survival Evolved, and that's because I'm a complete nerd for anything prehistoric, and riding around on an Allosaur is something that my five-year-old self always dreamed of doing. Because of the game mechanics, it would be kind of tricky to actually tell a story in ARC, but it isn't impossible. I'm here to tell stories and have fun. And the things I find most fun about ARC are building forts and taming creatures, so maybe I'll do more of a casual Let's Play style with that 
if I do, I could maybe transition it into a roleplay. I do have an idea, but really, if I'm gonna use Ark as just a way to chill out and have fun and give my brain a break from working on Skyrim going forward, adding an overarching plot about the lore on top might not be the best idea. Fun fact, Ark has lore. It's kind of depressing. Moving on. Do you voice these live as you play? Pretty much. All of the gameplay is one take improv, unless something breaks midway through a dungeon and I have to go back and redo a section, which is why it tends to be a lot clunkier than the cutscenes sometimes. In theory, I could do live streams, but in practice, you would not believe how much mouse clicking and throat clearing I have to edit out of each episode. Who's been your favorite character to voice and do for this series? They're all my favorites in their own way, but honestly, it's Mordgood. I slide into her accent just wandering around the house talking to people or the cats or inanimate objects. And as much fun as it is to do Arden's machine gun delivery or Ingrath's growl or Zaytest's everything, it's gotta be Mordgood. She's just a little ball of sunshine and it's kind of refreshing in a cast dominated by people with a slightly more jaded outlook. Would Ingrath and Arden ever adopt a child? This question has actually been asked before in a Q&A, but I wanted to update it once again now that Arden knows the full story behind what Ingrath does and who he is. Basically, the answer is no. Except in the sense that Ingrath adopted Zaytest, sorta. Would Ingrath help train up and sort of raise kids that ended up in the Dark Brotherhood because they didn't have a better option? Definitely. He's done that before. He might end up being a sort of parental figure to Aventus Aretino if the kid ever ends up finding the Brotherhood. As far as Arden is concerned, he is not in any position to be dealing with kids being a vampire and having two rather time-consuming operations to handle. Is the Bruma Sanctuary an actual sanctuary, or is it just a random cave? I used the Bruma Caverns out of convenience. I have no idea whether or not the Beyond Skyrim Cyrodiil team had that idea too. According to Cicero's journal, Bruma did in fact have a sanctuary. Having not played Oblivion, I have no idea where it would actually be, so the answer is... In Dawnbreakers, yes. If anyone else wants to say the sanctuary was elsewhere, that's also totally valid, because Dragon Breaks exist. Who does the subtitles on your videos? Most of them are auto-generated, if at all. I made an attempt with a few episodes of intonation, but I already do everything else myself, and I have to save time somewhere. I did hide a few jokes in the subtitles of the April Fool's story recap video, though. You know how a lot of YouTubers have evil versions of themselves? What would yours be? Bold of you to assume I'm not the evil version already. What are your plans for Anniversary Edition? I plan to stay away from it at all costs, honestly. Is the next project in the same continuity as Dawnbreakers? If it isn't, how is the Dragonborn going to be handled? It is not? There may be heists and trickery involved. There may not even be a Dragonborn. We won't know until the story starts. Do you have any plans for after the next project? When I first started writing the answers for this, my answer was no, until The Elder Scrolls VI or more Beyond Skyrim comes out. But then I had an idea. So... we'll see. You have Legacy of the Dragonborn in your game, so how come you haven't done any of it or the quests? Lack of time and narrative relevance. I originally installed it thinking that the archaeology skill would be its own separate thing, which would have been perfect for Arden, but... alas. And it's such a big mod that I couldn't very well just take it back out again without seriously mugging things up. And also, the crystals are fun. If there was just a shiny rocks mod, I would put that in my game for my own magpie reasons. What do you think of XYZ mod? What I think about mods truly doesn't matter. If I can use it, I'll use it. If I can't use it, I've probably already looked at it and come to that conclusion for a very good reason. My opinion on mods shouldn't affect your opinion on mods. How you want to set up your game is none of my business. I could tell you which mods I prefer, but just because I like Vivid Landscapes mountains doesn't make Majestic Mountains any less valid. Are you going to use Midwood Isle, Worm's Tooth, Vigilant, Lucy and Sophia, Interesting NPCs, etc.? As far as NPCs like Lucian are concerned, having done four and a half years of role-playing with and around Inigo, much as I enjoy his banter, I actually prefer my own silent followers. Yeah, it's a lot of work to make them because they're scripted on their own framework, but they do, more or less, only the things that I want them to do, and none of the things that I don't. Like, 
I don't have to worry about NPC Arden commenting about the location when player character Ingrath is in the middle of a sentence. I created Zaytest specifically to work in tandem with Inigo, and even then, he sort of got sidelined toward the end of the story. Major props to the creators of characters like Lucian, Inigo, Ori, and Caden, though, because hot dang making voiced NPCs with quests is so much work. As far as any other mods are concerned, like locations or quest mods, for example, unless I can find a good narrative-based reason to use a mod, the answer will almost always be no. My mod list exists in service of the story, not the other way around, which is how I've kept my game under 200 mods, and probably how my saves have held up this long. This is not a mod showcase channel. For that, I'd recommend Zero Period Productions, Bro Duel, or Heavy Burns. Last question before my voice completely dies on me. Why don't you have more subscribers? I could be cynical and jaded and say it's probably because there's a certain percentage of people who play Skyrim that might take umbrage with the fact that I and many of my characters are queer, neurodivergent, and or gender non-conforming, but I think it's far more likely that the cause is my own sheer lack of social media presence and the fact that the YouTube algorithm doesn't push non-monetized videos as much. Which, I probably will never monetize my videos if I can get away with it because I don't want my cutscenes getting interrupted by commercials, thanks. <sighs> I have a Patreon if you want to support me that way, though. By the way, good job to all of you. I'm proud to say that most of my viewers are subscribed, so like, Pat yourselves on the back for that one. And with that, I think I'm gonna end this video because my voice is dying. I decided to record this in the morning, and I don't usually do that. But I hope you all enjoyed. I hope you learned something. I hope I answered your questions to the best of my ability. And I hope to see you next week when I put out a video about what else I learned in four and a half years of screenwriting for Skyrim. <laughs> see you then.